Finally, I'd like to wish everybody in the room a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to everyone. And for our newest friends, also Happy Hanukkah. So, um, this, is a, uh, this is a really fun topic for us because we have a panel here today. Uh, this is something we haven't done in an awful long time. Um, and I think we'd like to get uh, in the habit of doing a little bit more often. So we'll be uh, having a conversation today about wind energy in Maine. And we have a number of people here who are with you who can add expertise from an administration perspective, from a regular uh, activist perspective, and a more national scope. Uh, there's lots of different uh, points of view that I think you're going to find at this panel today that hopefully should uh, be very interesting for you. So before, obviously, we get to the actual program itself, uh, my usual programming notes, if you have your comment cards in front of you, please make sure you fill those out. Tell us how you uh, how much you loved this presentation, because you will love it. Uh, tell us uh, if you like this topic and what uh, things you think we could do in the future. And if you fill that thing out, we'll have Nathan come around and collect these at the end of the program, and then we'll do a drawing. And we'll do two of them. It's the Christmas season and the Hanukkah season, so we will give away gifts. We have two gifts for you this time. Uh, first one is one we give away frequently, How Money Walks. This is How $2 Trillion Moved Between States and Why It Matters by Travis Brown. And we have this one here as well, Falling in Love with America, again by Jim DeMint. So uh, we'll do two drawings. The first person I draw gets to pick which one they want, and the second person stuck with the other book. So um, Again, before I get going on the rest of the program, I do want to thank my members of my board of directors who are here. Uh, if I miss anybody, please let me know. But I think I saw Dick Jackson, who's sitting here on the front. Larry Rubenstein on the right here, uh, as well as Ginger Durier, our, chair, our board chair, and uh, one of our newer, one of our newer board members, Susan Dench, is here in the front row. As I always say, we couldn't do anything that we do at the uh, at the uh, Maine Heritage Policy Center without their help, and it's uh, always great to see them here actually supporting our events as well. Um, I also see a couple members of my board of advisors here. I see Lisa Martin. Um, anybody else I'm missing? Because I didn't write this one down. Susan Hamill is in the corner there. Uh, so our board of advisors, for those of you who don't know, is a group of people who give us their level of expertise in a number of industries uh, to help us with policy development and development of fundraising and all the other things that we do with the Maine Heritage Policy Center. So we want to thank them very much as well. So all that said, let's get to the program. The, uh, the Maine Prosperity Luncheon this month is about wind energy, as I mentioned. And how we sold this to you when you guys got our emails and our, our, our publications was that the Wind Energy Act of 2008 was sold to, the, uh, sold to the people of Maine as a boon to Maine's economy, a job creator, and a necessary step to make Maine a leader in renewable energy. Now, several years after the law went into effect, it's time to take a look at how the industry has developed and what Maine has gotten uh, out of our investment for that aggressive push for wind energy. With increasing frequency, Maine, many Mainers have, have raised excuse me, concerns about the law's unintended consequences and questioned whether it's accomplished any of its stated goals. Concerns over the nature, conservation, energy efficiency, and government subsidies have again made the wind industry a topic of discussion here. So just to let you know how this is going to proceed, uh, our goal here today is to host a fair and in-depth conversation about the wind industry in Maine. Uh, I say fair because there are a number of competing interests who have a stake in the wind industry and what direction it goes in the future. That includes manufacturers, builders, residents of the towns where these turbines are built, uh, tourists, main taxpayers, and of course energy rate payers across the state of Maine. Uh, I say in depth because uh, as I think everyone here knows, this is an extraordinarily complex topic which touches on questions of government funding, tax subsidies, tax credits, economic development, environmentalism, tourism, and local municipal governance. So it's a big topic to talk about, there's a lot of perspectives, and it's not quite as simple as any of us would like to make it out to be. So I hope that when you leave here today, you will uh, have learned a little bit of something new and walk away with a better perspective on the wind industry in Maine and how it affects us from top to bottom. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce my panel here to my left. Uh, to my immediate left is Dan Remian. Uh, Dan, raise your hand. Dan is a citizen activist with years of experience in local politics. Dan currently serves as the chairman of the planning board of the town of Cushing, as well as on their board of assessors. A former engineer with decades of experience on the planning boards and zoning commissions, Dan has turned his attention to the wind industry of Maine. He is the mastermind, the mastermind behind the Citizens Task Force on Wind Power, uh, some of whose materials you can see in the back there, a coalition of citizens concerned about the wind industry in Maine. 
Dan is also spearheading a citizen's initiative to amend Maine's win law. To his immediate left is Lisa Linoles. Did I say Linos. Right? Thank you. Linos. Linos. Ms. Linos is an expert on the impacts of industrial scale wind energy development on the natural environment, communities, and the regional grid systems. Ms. Linos has also served as the executive director and spokesperson for the Wind Action Group, a national advocacy, fo uh, advocacy group focused on the impact and benefits and analysis of policy issues associated with industrial wind energy developments since its foundation in 2006. Uh, Ms. Linoz has presented and debated wind energy issues at numerous venues across the United States, including the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, that's a mouthful, Society of Environmental Journalists, and the Boston Museum of Science's Lecture Series. She has appeared on CNN, NPR, and CBS Evening News, as well as the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Christian Science Monitor. She has also testified on the subject before the House Science, Space, and Technology Subcommittee. So, welcome to Lisa as well. To Lisa's left is Tim Schneider. Tim Schneider was appointed the Maine Public Advocate by Governor Paul LePage and confirmed by the Maine Legislature in May 2013 for a four-year term. The State Public Advocate's Office represents the interests of utility customers in the state of Maine. Prior to becoming a public advocate, Tim represented clients in a wide range of matters before the Maine Public Utilities Commission in FERC, focused primarily on national gas and electricity, natural gas, excuse me, and electricity. Tim received his BA from Harvard University and his JD from the New York University School of Law. So let's uh, please join me in welcoming our panel today. So let's get right into this. Now the structure of this panel, just so you know, is I, I may be asking a specific person a question, but the panel is very uh, informal here. So as they begin describing their answers to, to uh, topics I'm giving them, uh, they all have release authority to jump in and talk at any time. So we should probably get a good back and forth between everyone here. Um, and, and hopefully by the end of this, uh, I won't have eaten up too much time and we'll be able to actually do some questions from the audience as well. Um, so without further ado, though, let's get right into the programming. Uh, Tim, if you don't mind me starting with you, um, I'd like to talk about wind power broadly. Um, you know, not everybody here is an expert in what this is. And uh, I think we should probably start the ball rolling by talking quickly about how wind turbines differ from more traditional energy sources. Uh, by that I mean how much power turbines individually produce, how they operate, how reliable they are, uh, their environmental impact and that, and that type of a question. What, is, what does wind power look like in relation to these other industries? Yeah, so I think I, it's best to frame this um, wind as a significant factor in the New England electricity grid is a relatively recent development, and so it probably makes sense to frame wind energy. Tim, can you get the mic a little closer? Because I don't yeah, think is this better? Can people hear me now? A little more. Give it a little more oomph, and I think yeah, I can hear it much closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's probably useful to frame the difference between wind power and the other dominant forms of generation on the New England electricity grid. So from, and I think as a practical matter, that's fossil fire generation and it's primarily natural gas, which now constitutes more than 50% of the power <coughs> generated in New England, which you may have heard about from other people or if you've been listening to the news. You know. We need a lot of gas because we use it more and more to generate electricity, and it's created um, uh, historically low prices in New England. Um, the main difference between those generators and um, wind generation is that um, is dispatchability. So when you tell a natural gas fire generator to come on, it generally comes on and responds. Um, but if a wind turbine is there and the wind's not blowing, you can't tell that wind turbine blowing to go on. Um, and the electricity grid balances in real time, so you need to be producing as much electricity as you're using constantly. There's no, as yet, really good storage technology beyond pump storage and some, some minor batteries. We don't have grid-scale storage. So one of the issues we um, have with wind on the grid is that um, it's a variable resource. It comes up and down in response to the weather, frankly. Um, and so you'll need to have other resources there matching it. It's the other big difference is that there's no fuel cost. So there's a commodity risk that's associated with a grid that relies on natural gas. We have very cheap uh, electricity during the summer when there's lots of pipeline capacity to bring cheap gas from, from Pennsylvania and the Marcellus Shale. Um, but in the winter, when we don't have enough pipeline capacity, our, gas, our commodity price of that natural gas skyrockets. And so our electricity prices increase. But the price of um, electricity from a wind turbine is relatively constant. It's all upfront capital cost. There's no ongoing fuel cost. And that's a, that's a real big difference from uh, the, pr the prevailing uh, electricity generation, electricity generators in New England. And I think those two differences have a lot of implications 
um, for why people th why people want wind and some of the challenges it, pr it proposes. Yeah, absolutely. Can I, Lisa, can jump I right add in. to that. There are two two significant differences that I one is a significant difference, and one I want to add to what Tim said. Um, renewable energy in general, wind is no different, requires that the power plant be built where the fuel source is. You cannot take wind, put it in a truck, transport it to the turbines and cause the turbines <coughs> to run. You have to build the turbines where the wind is, you have to build the dam where the water is, you have to build the biomass facility close to the forest because of the cost of transporting forest products. So what happens there is you wind power plants are built in areas where we're least likely to have demand for electricity. That is a significant issue. So what do we end up building? Transmission. Lots and lots of transmission in areas that we normally in New England or anywhere in the United States would not build transmission because the markets, our energy markets have been set up to encourage power plant development close to demand. Wind energy and, um, and hydro and other forms of generation turn that on its head. Solar is a little bit different, landfill gas a little bit different, you will get the power, those power plants closer to demand because you can build rooftop solar. And, and <laughs> landfill gas is typically where a city is. Um, the other issue I wanted to point out and, and just add to what Tim was saying is that yes, fuel does, there is no fuel cost associated with wind energy, but the cost of building a wind power plant is significantly more expensive than building a natural gas plant. When you talk about the cost of building, to build a natural gas plant, the, you know, the metric they use is $700 a kilowatt. Is, is that right? $700, ah, yeah, a kilowatt. A $700 a kilowatt to build a natural gas plant. So you, know, you could do the math, if it's a, hundred, a 600 megawatt gas plant, there's, it's that, still at that cost, it's, it's very low compared to wind, which costs here in New England between $1,900 and $2,200 a kilowatt. There's a project in New Hampshire that would cost $2,500 a kilowatt to build. Very, very expensive. And when you have a project that does not produce every hour of every day, it doesn't make enough electricity to earn back the cost of its capital. So there's no fuel cost, but still the cost of recovering the capital, it requires subsidies to do that. Uh, Dan, if I could kind of go to you on, on my next question here. You've been a, a very vocal critic of wind power over the years, and you frequently highlight the scenic damage to the landscape, uh, issues related to transmission lines, which we just heard about a little bit, and the raw acreage required to produce any significant energy uh, as it compares to a more traditional form of, uh, of energy production. I wonder if you could expand on those concerns for the audience and tell them a little bit more about your perspective. Well, uh, one of the things is the destruction of communities in Maine. Families and friends also. Uh, when these uh, wind developers come in, they kind of hit people one-on-one -on -one and try to get a feeling. They even have psychologists with them uh, to figure out how, what people are thinking and how they're going to oppose these things. So it divides community. But the, the main thing that I see happening in Maine is we're destroying our forests, which are carbon sinks. We're defore uh, deforesting areas that are, and putting turbines up where tourists come, and I've got some anecdotal evidence of that. But one of the things that we have to have at a power plant is a fall, small footprint and next to population. Wind does not satisfy any of these. We have a small plant here in uh, Westbrook. Uh, it's on a 32-acre industrial site. It has a 1.94 acre, less than 2-acre footprint. It's putting out 542 megawatts. To do that with wind would take in the city of Portland with wind turbines. It just doesn't make sense. And it's close to, trans it's close to the population, transmission lines are small, and the losses are, are small. And it's a very efficient plant compared to wind. I, I just to add to that, I mean, I think that that illustration of the, the, the difference, the needing to set in your load is a, is a good point. But, you know, all the other forms of generation we have also rely on additional infrastructure to make them work. If you stood up a natural gas plant in Westbrook and then just were done, you wouldn't have actually you wouldn't actually generate any electricity, right? So you also need so one of the big issues we have right now is even the existing natural gas generation fleet we have in New England is going to require substantial infrastructure to, to bring that gas from other places. And I think there are people in in Pennsylvania who might say that there are um, impacts on those same impacts on from natural gas. 
just not in me. Tim, if I could go back to you uh, for a moment here, can you talk to us about the impact that federal regulations and tax incentives uh, have had on this industry, particularly subsidies for wind development uh, and so on? Have have they had on, <clears throat> excuse me? Have they had a major impact on the industry? How has this developed over time a little bit? And specifically, how has this impacted the viability of wind as a as a uh, actual energy choice for states? Sure. So the wind industry both nationally and I think Maine is no exception, often experiences a boom-bust cycle tied to federal tax incentives. So um, the primary tax incentive for wind right now is the uh, production tax credit, though there have been periods of time where they've had different, different incentives available to them. And sort of when that incentive is about to, going, about to go away, you'll see a lot of wind development, a lot of people trying to commence construction so that they can um, be be eligible for those tax credits, and then things will fall off when those tax credits expire briefly, as they have um, over the past 10 years, um, for brief periods of time. You know, as, if those of you who've been following the news, um, I think just within the last 24 to 48 hours, there's been an expansion announced to the, both the investment and the production tax credit, the production tax credit, which will primarily affect land, um, to go through 2020, I believe, um, with a phase out. But the big impact of that is that it makes um, wind financially attractive to um, and competitive in, the, in in New England. So we, main, the main PUC recently signed a contract for um, a 20-year long-term contract with a, a wind facility in Maine, where the price was um, around four cents per kilowatt hour, which is uh, over 20 years. So they locked in that price with small escalators, and that's lower than the average average wholesale price of electricity in Maine. So it's price competitive. But it, I mean, as, as opponents of wind power point out, it's only price competitive through the addition of those tax incentives. Without them, it would not be. If I could add to that, there are a couple of things that are important to understand with regard to the subsidies. There are two subsidies here in New England that are heavily uh, supporting wind energy development. There is the first one, which is the production tax credit, as Tim talked about. Production tax credit pays 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour generated by wind. And it applies to other renewables as well, but let's talk about wind. That's a, that's a tax credit. It's pre-tax value to the person who is now taking advantage of that credit is 3.5 cents. When you look at New England and the average cost of electricity in New England, this is the 24-7, 365 average, not what we're paying, say, at any one point in time, we're at about 4.5 cents. We have a subsidy coming from the federal government worth 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour. We have an elect okay, so that's that's a big deal. It's almost the value of the average cost of electricity that these guys are getting paid. Then we get over to our renewable energy, the RPS programs. Okay, the main of RPS right now happens to be satisfied for the most part. But if we, do, if the states here in New England have a mandate, all uh, five of the six states now have active mandates for renewable energy, and they require anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. But at some point, you know, it's, it varies what year we're at and when they're going to expire. Maine's is 10 percent. If you if you look at what's been paid to wind energy in New England, we're talking about 65 dollars, 66 dollars, or 6.5 cents, 6.6 cents, 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour. That's how much wind is getting in the form of a local subsidy through the RPS. The wind projects built in Maine are selling into Connecticut, they're selling into Massachusetts, they're selling into Rhode Island, and there they're getting very high values for in the form of subsidy. So when all is said and done, we're starting out of the gate giving wind upwards of $100, or, or excuse me, 10 cents a kilowatt hour in subsidy above and beyond the value of the energy. Go back to Tim for a sec. Yeah, Matt, I'm just, I think, because this is a main audience, I want to make a distinction here between the prices that southern New England states are paying for their renewable portfolio standards, paying that subsidy being paid to wind developers in Maine, and what Maine is paying. So um, Lisa described the price of renewable energy credits, the environmental attributes associated with wind um, in southern New England, and that's yeah around $65 per uh, megawatt hour. In, in Maine, the prices are around 5 
between five and ten. And uh, Maine's renewable portfolio standard is primarily met through biomass. Um, so I, know, I just want to make that distinction because I think it's important for a Maine audience that um, very little of Maine's RPS is where is going as a subsidy to wind developers, and the costs are not nearly the scale of what we see in southern New England states. Can I add to that, though? Is there something that's very important not to understand what's happening in Maine right now? Maine has, most of Maine's class one or new RPS has been satisfied behind, by behind the meter energy produced by your paper mills, okay? So your costs for your RPS, for your RECs, renewable energy credits, which are these subsidies I'm talking about, have been very low in the, you're right, in the $2, $3, $4 range per megawatt hour. Next to nothing, basically it's a subsidy to keep the, the paper mills in business, okay? There's a problem though. In the last couple of months, a number of those paper mills have gone out of business, have pulled out entirely. That is reducing your supply of class one or new RECs. And as a result, the current market price, Tim, you should, I'll send you the information. <laughs> the current market price for renewable energy credits in Maine is $30 a megawatt hour. And it, ha it has the potential, based on your law, to go up to $65. So we don't know where Maine is going to be, but there's going to be a bit of a price shock in the next year if that's not resolved. You're going to want some of that wind to come here. Let me uh, pose a question to the whole panel, and you uh, can jump in as you see fit on this one. Uh, just to kind of wrap up our, our learning phase about wind power broadly, um, critics have long charged that wind energy does not produce enough energy, uh, is inefficient, it's unreliable, and generally incapable of being a serious part of America's energy portfolio. Is that true? Um, or are developments in technology more effective ways of storing energy and transferring that? Uh, as well as the <clears throat> excuse me upfront costs that have been produced uh, through subsidies, doing anything to change that. Dan, well, you, you haven't had a chance to talk in a while, so let me start it off. <laughs> well, Hawaii tried to store wind energy in a, in a huge battery uh, bank, uh, which actually blew up and caused all kinds of environmental damage. So that technology isn't working. <laughs> Actually, are you asking if it doesn't produce enough? I'm sorry. I'm not well, I mean, my question really relates to the fact that uh, the federal government has obviously made a huge priority in trying to develop wind as an alternative energy source. And critics have said, uh, I think with a lot of merit, that it doesn't produce a heck of a lot of energy. It costs a lot to put up. Uh, it's not very efficient. You can't rely on it because, obviously, as we said earlier, uh, wind is a somewhat unreliable uh, source of energy because it goes up and down. Um, are those critics right? I mean, is this something that we shouldn't pursue, or are there some merits because of developments in technology and, and how the cost has gone down due to something? Thank you. Okay, I, there's some, one important point I, I would like to make about that is that there's been a, a transfer or a transformation in the understanding of why wind energy is being built. In 2008, the Department of Energy came out with a, its first report, big report on wind energy, and it was titled 30% wind, uh, wind Power, excuse me, 20% wind power by 2030. Okay, that was a pretty important document they came out with, and it was intended to lay the groundwork for how the United States can reach the point of meeting 20% uh, of our electricity needs through wind power. In that document, it flat out said, okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you what it says. It's, it says directly that the only reason we're building wind power is to reduce our carbon footprint. We're not building wind power to meet our energy needs. We're building wind power to reduce our carbon footprint. And, and to give you a sense, there's one of the, point, one of the quotes directly, oh, I think I almost directly, okay. This, this is a quote out of that document. It is not a, so one of the things a lot of people say is, well, you have to back up wind. That's a, that's a problem with wind. You, you, you run it and you have to back it up because the wind's not always there. One of the quotes out of that report, it is not appropriate to think in terms of backing up wind because wind capacity is installed to generate low emission energy, but not to meet load requirements. We're not building wind to meet our demand for electricity. We're building it to lower our carbon emissions. And then it says, if wind had some capacity value, this is right out of DOE's report. If wind has some capacity value for reliability planning purposes, that should be viewed as a bonus, but not a necessity. Somehow between 2008 and 2015, the Department of Energy decided that wind energy can meet all our energy needs and everything will be wonderful. Take down coal, take down natural gas, and we're cool. That's, that's the misconception. If people were realistic about wind, why wind is being built, 
we have a better understanding of where it should be built. Tim, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah. I, so, I think it's, I guess I'll stick with what I know. I don't know much about uh, batteries blowing up in Hawaii or Department of Energy reports. Um, so, in, um, in New England, we have a natural gas fleet that is increasingly reliant on natural gas, more and more than any other part of the country. Um, and increasingly, these are really efficient, modern natural gas plants. Um, and one of the features of those natural gas plants is they actually pair pretty well with wind. Unlike, say, a nuclear plant or a baseload coal plant, they're able to respond um, relatively quickly to changes in production. Remember I described at the outset, we need to balance production and load at all, at all times. Um, so I think for New England, um, wind is actually a pretty good fit for the grid we have right now. Um, and it's, as a practical matter, the way that our wholesale markets work, when um, a wind plant in Maine is generating, that means that a natural gas fire plant somewhere else in New England, maybe in Maine, but maybe in southern New England, is likely producing less. Those, those plants bid in at zero into the wholesale markets. They shift the supply curve, and they lower prices, at least in the near term. I think, um, so I don't, I don't think that you're likely to build a grid that is entirely wind. I don't think that's a, as a practical matter or anything that's likely in the near future. But I think that um, wind could play a part of the overall energy mix in New England in ways that would be beneficial to electricity customers. 